Chapter Eight of the Forgotten Planet by Murray Leinster. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. A flight continues. Part Two. When they had been in the valley for a week, Burl went off on a bitter journey by himself. Part of his motivation, probably, was a childish resentment. He had been the great man of the tribe. He was no longer so great because his particular qualities were not needed. And perhaps, with some unconscious intent to punish them for their lessened appreciation, he went off in a pet. He still carried spear and club, but the grandeur of his costume had deteriorated. His cloak was gone. The moth antenna he had worn bound to his forehead were now so draggled that they were ridiculous. He went off angrily to be rid of his fellow's indifference. He found the upward slopes, which were the valley's literal boundaries. They promised nothing. He found a minor valley in which a labyrinth spider had built its shining snare. Burl almost scorned the creature. He could kill it if he chose, merely by stabbing it through the walls of its silken nest as it waited for unlucky insects to blunder into the intricate web. He saw praying mantises. Once he came upon the extraordinary egg container of the mantis tribe, a gigantic leaf-shaped mass of solidified foam, whipped out of some special plastic compound which the mantis secretes and in which the eggs are laid. He found a caterpillar wrapped in its thick cocoon, and because he was not foraging and not particularly hungry, he inspected it with care. With great difficulty, he even broke the strand of silk that formed it, unreeling several feet in curiosity. Had he meditated, Burl would have seen that this was cord which could be used to build snares as spiders did. It could also be used to make defenses in which, if built strongly and well, even hunting spiders might be tangled and dispatched. But again, he was not knowingly looking for things to be of use. He coddled his sense of injury against the tribe. He punished them by leaving them. He encountered a four-foot praying mantis that raised its saw-toothed forelimbs and waited immobile for him to come within reach. He had trouble getting away without a fight. His spear would have been a clumsy weapon against so slender a target, and the club certainly not quick enough to counter the insect's lightning-like movements. He was bothered. That day he hunted ants. The difficulty was mainly that of finding individual ants alone who could be slaughtered without drawing hordes of others into the fight. Before nightfall, he had three of them, foot-long carcasses, slung at his belt. Near sunset, he came upon another, fairly recent, praying mantis hatchling. It was almost an ambush. The young monster stood completely mobile and waited for him to walk into its reach. Burl performed a deliberate experiment, something that had not been done for a very long time on the forgotten planet. The small, grisly creature stood as high as Burl's shoulders. It would be a deadly antagonist. Burl tossed it a dead ant. It struck so swiftly that the motion of its horrible forearms could not be seen. Then it ignored Burl, devouring the tidbit. It was a discovery that was immediately and urgently useful. On the second day of his aimless journey, Burl saw something that would be even more deadly and appalling than the red dust had been for his kind. It was a female black hunting spider the so-called American tarantula. When he glimpsed the thing, the blood drained from Burl's face. As the monster moved out of sight, Burl, abandoning any other project he might have intended, headed for the place his tribe had more or less settled in. He had news which offered the satisfaction of making him much needed again, but he would have traded that pleasure ten hundred times over for the simple absence of that one creature from this valley. That female tarantula 
meant simply and specifically that the tribe must flee or die. This place was not paradise. The entry of the spider into the region had preceded the arrival of the people. A giant, even of its kind, it had come across some pass among the mountains for reasons only it could know. But it was deadliness beyond compare. Its legs spanned yards. The fangs were needle-sharp and feet in length and poisoned. Its eyes glittered with insatiable, insane bloodlust. Its coming was ten times more deadly to the humans as to other living creatures of the valley than a Bengal tiger loose in a human city would have been. It was bad enough in itself, but it brought more deadly disaster still behind it. Bumping and bouncing behind its abdomen as it moved, fastened to its body by dirty silken ropes, the creature dragged the burden, which was its own ferocity, many times multiplied. It was dragging an egg bag larger than its body, which was feet in diameter. The female spider would carry this ghastly burden, cherishing it, until the eggs hatched. And then there would be four to five hundred small devils loose in the valley. From the instant of their hatching, they would be as deadly as their parent. Though the offspring would be small, with legs spanning no more than a foot, their bodies would be the size of a man's fist and able to leap two yards. Their tiny fangs would be no less envenomed than their mother's. In stark maniacal hatred of all other life, they would at least equal the hungry gray horror which had begot them. Burl told his tribesmen. They listened, eyes large with fright, but not quite afraid. The thing had not yet happened. When Burl insistently commanded that they follow him on a new journey, they nodded uneasily, but slipped away. He could not gather the tribe together. Always there were members who hid from him, and when he went in search of them, the ones he had gathered vanished before he could return. There were days of bright light and murder, and nights of slow rain and death in the valley. The great creatures under the cloud bank committed atrocities upon each other and blandly dined upon their victims. Unthinkingly, solicitous parents paralyzed creatures to be left living and helpless for their young to feed on. There were enormities of cruelty done in the matter-of-fact fashion of the insect world. To these things the humans were indifferent. They were uneasy, but like other humans everywhere, they would not believe the worst until the worst arrived. Two weeks after their coming to the valley, the worst was there. When that day came, the first gray light of dawn found the humans in a shivering, terrified group in a completely suicidal position. They were out in the open, not hidden, but in plain view. They dared not hide any more. The furry gray monster's brood had hatched. The valley seemed to swarm with small gray demons, which killed and killed, even when they could not devour. When they encountered each other, they fought in slavering fury, and the victors, in such duels, dined upon their brethren. But always they hunted more things to kill. They were literally maniacs, and they were too small and too quick to fight with spears or clubs. So now, at daybreak, the humans looked about despairingly for death to come to them. They had spent the night in the open, lest they be trapped in the very thickets that had formerly been their protection. They were in clear sight of the large gray murderer, if it should pass that way, and they did not dare hide because of that orgerish creature's brood. The monster appeared. A young girl saw it and cried out chokingly. It had not seen them. They watched it leap upon and murder a vividly colored caterpillar near the limits of vision in the morning mist. It was in the tribe's part of the valley. Its young swarmed everywhere. The valley could have been a paradise, but it was doomed to become a charnel house. 
and then Burl shook himself. He had been angry when he left his tribe. He had been more angry when he returned, and they would not obey him. He had remained with them, petulantly silent, displaying the offended dignity he felt, and elaborately refusing to acknowledge any overtures, even from Saya. Burl had acted rather childishly, but his tribesmen were like children. It was the best way for him to act. They shivered, too hopeless even to run away, while the shaggy monster feasted a half mile away. There were six men and seven women besides himself, and the rest were children, from gangling adolescence to one babe in arms. They whimpered a little. Then Saya looked imploringly at Burl, coquetry forgotten now. The other whimpered more loudly. They had reached the stage of despair now, when they could draw the monster to them by blubbering in terror. This was the psychological moment. Burl said dourly, Come. He took Saya's hand and started away. There was but one direction in which any human being could think to move in this valley at this moment. It was the direction away from the grisly mother of horrors. It happened to be the way up the valley wall. Burl started up that slope. Saya went with him. Before they had gone ten yards, Dor spoke to his wife. They followed Burl with their three children. Five yards more, and Jack, agitatedly, began to bustle his family into movement. Old John, wheezing, frantically, scuttled after Burl, and Corey, competently, set out with the youngest of her children in her arms and the others marching before her. Within seconds more, all the tribe was in motion. Burl moved on, aware of his following, but ignoring it. The procession continued in his wake simply because it had begun to do so. Dick, his adolescent brashness, beaten down by terror, nevertheless, regarded Burl's stained weapon with the inevitable envy of the half-grown for achievement. He saw something half-buried in the soil, and after a fearful glance behind, he moved aside to tug at it. It was part of the armor of a former rhinoceros beetle. Tet joined him. They made an act of great daring, of lingering to find themselves weapons as near as possible to Burl's. A quarter mile on, the fugitives passed a struggling milkweed plant, no more than twenty feet high, and already scabrous with scale and rusts upon its lower parts. Ants marched up and down its stalk in a steady single file, placing aphids from their nearby ant city on suitable spots to feed, and to multiply as only parthenogenic aphids can do. But already on the far side of the milkweed an ant lion climbed up to do murder among them. The ant lion, of course, was the larval form of the lacewing fly. The aphids were its predestined prey. Burl continued to march, holding Saya's hand. The reek of formic acid came to his nostrils. He ignored it. Ants were as much prey to his tribesmen now as crabs and crayfish to other shore-dwelling tribesmen on long-forgotten earth. But Burl was not concerned with food now. He stalked on toward the mountain slopes. Dick and Tet brandished their new weapons. They looked fearfully behind them. The monster, from whom they fled, was lost in its gruesome feasting, and they were a long way from it now. There was a steady, single-file procession of ants, with occasional gaps in the line. The procession passed the line through one of those gaps. Beyond it, Ted and Dick conferred. They dared each other. They went scrambling back to the line of ants. Their weapons smote. The slaughtered ants died instantly and were quickly dragged from the formic acid-scented path. The remaining ants went placidly on their way. The weapons struck again. The two adolescents had to outdo each other, but they had as much food as they could carry, gloating 
each claiming to have been most daring and to have the largest bag of game, they ran panting after the tribe. They grandly distributed their take of game. It was a form of boasting. But the tribe's folk accepted the gifts automatically. It was, after all, food. The two gangling boys, jabbering at each other, raced back once more. Again they returned with dangling masses of foodstuff. Half scores of foot-long creatures, whose limbs, at least, contained firm meat. Behind, the ant-lion made his onslaught into the stupidly feasting aphids, and warrior ants took alarm and thrust forward to offer battle. Tumult arose upon the milkweed. Burl led his followers toward the mountainside. He reached a minor eminence and looked about him. Caution was the price of existence on this world. Two hundred feet away, a small scurrying horror raged and searched among the rough-edged layers of what on other worlds was called paper mold or rock tripe. Here it was thick as quilting, and infinitesimal creatures denned under it. The sixteen-inch spider devoured them, making glutinous sounds. But it was busy, and all spiders are relatively short-sighted. Burl turned to Saya and realized that all his tribe had followed him fearfully, even to the small height he climbed only to look around from. Dor had taken advantage of Burl's pause. There was an empty cricket shell partly overwhelmed by the fungoid soil. He tore free now a hollow, sickle-shaped jaw. It was curved and sharp and deadly if properly wielded. Dor had seen Burl kill things. He had even helped. Now, very grimly, he tried to imagine killing something all alone. Jack saw him working on the sickle-shaped weapon. He tugged at the cricket's ransacked carcass for another weapon. Dick and Tet vaingloriously pretended to fight between themselves with their recently acquired instruments for killing. John wheezed and panted. Old Tama complained to herself in whispers, not daring to make sounds in the daylight. The rest waited until Burl should lead them further. When Burl turned angry eyes upon them, he was beginning to do such things deliberately now. They all regarded him humbly. Now they remembered that they had been hungry, and he had gotten food for them, and they had been paralyzed by terror, and he dared to move. They definitely had a feeling of dependence upon him, for the present moment only. Later, their feelings of humbleness would diminish, in proportion as he met their needs for leadership, they would tend to try to become independent of him. His leadership would be successful in proportion as he taught them to lead themselves. But Burl perceived this only dimly. At the moment, it was pleasing to have all his tribe regard him so worshipfully, even if not in quite the same fashion as Saya. He was suddenly aware now, at any rate, while they were so frightened, they would obey him. So he invented an order for them to obey. I carry sharp things, he said sternly. Some of you have gotten sharp things. Now everybody must carry sharp things to fight with. Humbly, they scattered to obey. Saya would have gone with them, but Burl held her back. He did not quite know why. It could have been that the absolute equality of the sexes in cravenness was due to end, and for his own vanity, Burl would undertake the defense of Saya. He did not analyze so far. He did not want her to leave him, so he prevented it. The tribe's folk scattered. Dor went with his wife to help her arm herself. Jack uneasily followed his. John went timorously, where the picked-over remnant of the cricket's carcass might still yield an instrument of defense. Corey laid her youngest child at Burl's feet while she went fearfully to find some toothed instrument meeting Burl's specifications of sharpness. There was a stifled scream. A ten-year-old boy, he was Dick's younger brother, stood paralyzed. 
He stared in an agony of horror at something that had stepped from behind a misshapen, fungoid object, fifty yards from Burl, but less than ten yards from him. It was a pallidly green creature with a small head and enormous eyes. It stood upright like a man, and it was a few inches taller than a man. Its abdomen swelled gracefully into a leaf-like form. The boy faced it, paralyzed by horror, and it stood stock still. Its great, hideously spined arms were spread out in a pose of hypocritical benediction. It was a partly grown praying mantis, not too long hatched. It stood rigid, waiting benignly for the boy to come closer or to try to flee. If he had fled, it would fling itself after him with a ferocity besides which the fury of a tiger would be kittenish. If he approached, its fanged arms would flash down, pierce his body, and hold him terribly fast by the needle-sharp hooks that were so much worse than trap claws. And, of course, it would not wait for him to die before it began its meal. All the small party of humans stood frozen. It may be questioned whether they were filled with horror for the boy or cast into a deeper abyss of despair by the sight of a half-grown mantis. Only Burl, so far, had any notion of actually leaving the valley. To the rest, the discovery of one partly mature praying mantis meant that there would be hundreds of others. It would be impossible to evade the tiny, slavering demons, which were the brood of the great spider. It would be impossibility multiplied to live where a horde of small, yet vastly large fiends lived, raising their arms in a semblance of blessing before they did murder. Only Burl was capable of thought, and this was because vanity filled him. He had commanded and had been obeyed. Now obedience was forgotten because there was this young mantis. If the men had dreamed of fighting it, it could have destroyed any number of them by sheer ferocity and its arsenal of knives and daggers. But Burl was at once furious and experienced. He had encountered such a middle-sized monster when alone and deliberately had experimented with it. In consequence, he could dare to rage. He ran toward the mantis, he swung the small corpse of an ant, killed by Tet only minutes since, and hurled it past the terror-fascinated boy. He had hurled it at the mantis. It struck, and insects simply do not think. Something hurled at the ghastly young creature. Its arm struck ferociously to defend itself. The ant was heavy. Poised upright in its spectral attitude, the mantis was literally flung backward, but it rolled over, fighting the dead ant, with that frenzy which is not so much ferocity as mania. The small boy fled hysterically once the insect's attention was diverted. The human tribe gathered around Burl, many hundreds of yards away, again uphill. He was their rendezvous because of the example set by Corey. She had left her baby with Burl. When Burl dashed from the spot, Saya had quite automatically followed the instinct of any female for the young of its kind. She snatched up the baby before she fled, and of course she joined Burl when the immediate danger was over. The floor of the valley seemed a trifle indistinct from here. The mist that always hung in the air partly veiled the details of its horrors. It was less actual, not quite as deadly as it once had seemed. Burl said fiercely to his followers, Where are the sharp things? The tribesfolk looked at one another numbly. Then John muttered rebelliously, and old Tama raised her voice in shrill complaint. Burl had led them to this. There had been only the red dust in the place from which they had come, but here was a hunting spider and its young, and also a new hatching of mantises. They could dodge the red dust, but how could they escape the deaths that waited them here? 
I, I. Burl had persuaded them to leave their home and brought them here to die. Burl glared about him. It was neither courage nor resolution, but he had come to realize that to be admired by one's fellows was a splendid sensation. The more one was admired, the better. He was enraged that anyone dared to despair instead of thinking admirably about his remarkableness. I, said Burl haughtily, am not going to stay here. I go to a place where there are neither spiders nor mantises. Come. He held out his hand to Saya. She gave the child to Cory and confidently moved to follow him. Burl stalked grandly away, and she went with him. He went uphill, naturally. There were spiders and mantises in the valley, so many that to stay there meant death. So he moved to go somewhere else. And this was the climatic event that changed the whole history of humanity upon the forgotten planet. Up to this point, there may have been other individuals who had accomplished somewhat of Burl's kind of leadership. A few may have learned courage. It is possible that some even led their tribe folk upon migrations in search of safer lands to live in. But until Burl led his people out of a valley filled with food, up a mountainside toward the unknown, it was simply impossible for humans to rise permanently above the status of hunted vermin, at the mercy of monstrous, mindless creatures, whose forebears had most ironically been brought to the planet to prepare it for humans to live on. Burl was the first man to lead his followers toward the heights. End of chapter 8 Part 2